live now again to the House Rules Committee. They are meeting today, crafting rules for debate on health care legislation this weekend in the House. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. I believe uh, my friend uh, Mr. Cardoza had asked uh, for me to, to yield to him. I will at this time. You want us to move on? Thank you, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Um, as we reconvene here, I uh, want to say the following. Um, I've sat here for, and I'd, I'd like to be able to make this whole statement, and it's in support of your position. Um, I've sat here and I listened to Mr. Barton talk about how um, this process has been used in the past, and he's right, it has been used in the past. As I count, nearly 200 times we've used this process in the past. I don't think Mr. Barton votes for things that are unconstitutional. I don't think the other members here who have voted that way, or Mr. Boehner, or ourselves, have voted for anything illegal. But having said all of that, I don't believe it's smart for us to pass a bill this momentous with a deemed rule. I think it's perfectly legal. I think it's perfectly appropriate, because we've done it before. And that in the House, under the Articles of the Constitution, makes its own internal rules. However, I don't support us doing it, and I will not vote for a rule that deems as we've been talking about. Now, the rule doesn't say the word deem. It says that the conference report would be adopted, or the, the, the bill, the Senate bill would be adopted. But I don't think that that's the way we ought to go. And so I wanted to make the announcement here in the committee right now in this part of this process that I don't support that and won't support a rule that does it that way. But I will tell you that everything that Mr. Hoyer has said about this process is absolutely accurate in my mind. I believe him to have done it, said it absolutely correctly. Uh, and uh, I think it would stand the constitutional test. But I just don't believe that that's the way we should. And so I'm concurring in the fact that I don't think we should pass it in this manner. I think we should take three separate votes. I think we should take the rule vote. I think we should take a vote on reconciliation. And then I think we should take a, a vote adopting the Senate bill. So I thank uh, my friend uh, in reclaiming my time. I, I, I think he makes a, a very important uh, statement, especially at this time uh, in the process. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how the Supreme Court will rule if, if, the, if the Senate bill is deemed uh, passed. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I know about the, uh, in the Constitution, the fact that each house, it specifies that each house is responsible for its own rules. Obviously, that's true. But it also specifies, as uh, certainly the Supreme Court made clear in the line item veto case that, that exact language has to be adopted. So I don't, I, I think the majority, if it proceeds uh, by deeming the Senate bill passed, puts at, will put at risk uh, it, uh, its uh, legislation. Uh, and um, uh, Mr. Dreyer, uh, you asked to I, th I, I thank yield to Mr. Dreyer. I'd just like to clarify um, uh, uh, this gentleman's statement, and that is, um, this has been actually done six times, not 200 times. Now, there have been instances, I thank my friend for yielding, there have been instances where amendments have been taken, but on only six occasions has this been done in the past, and I just think it's important for the record to note that, and uh, no one knows exactly what the, the, uh, what the determination a court would make mm -hmm. on this is, as the gentleman from Miami has, has said uh, correctly, but, uh, but it, it, amendments have been taken, but not basically an entire bill like this. I, think and, my I agree. And reclaiming my time, the Supreme Court has not ruled. And, I, and none of those moments, of those instances, has this become an issue uh, that has been actually decided upon by the Supreme Court. I think this time it will ultimately, if the majority deems the Senate bill passed, it will reach that stage in the judicial uh, process. But uh, anyways, I thank you. Uh, I, th I thank all of the those uh, who have come to testify and, and uh, uh, for your courtesy, and uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield back. Well, I, I thank the gentleman, and again, I just want to reiterate what was said before, for the record, that um, 
at least one of those times, I think most of the people on the Republican side who were in this room voted that way. So it's, I mean, it, I mean, you, uh, you know, the, I know you don't like the process, process except when you vote for it. And, um, uh, but I think uh, what's at stake here is more than about the process of our rules. It's about uh, the process people have to go through when they try to get insurance. And, uh, you know, and tens of millions of people can't get insurance. And uh, I think that's, where, that's what this is about. Mr. Hastings, Florida. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, our chair lady is to be uh, complimented for her patience. And that is her patience, especially with all of us. Uh, two members of our distinguished panel, one that isn't here now, commented that uh, the Rules Committee is a different committee in regards to time, and that's very true. Um, I'll try not to take a lot of time. But I think it's important that we try to um, uh, put in context some of the discussion that has been ongoing. Um, my bona fides um, are pretty widely known. Um, I came here uh, with some real negative celebrity of um, uh, having gone through uh, a process, interestingly enough, all the way to the United States Supreme Court on three different occasions. And we were fond of saying on our legal team that the Hastings case has made bad law. Um, but uh, I'm 47 years a lawyer. 13 of those years were spent as a judge. I've interpreted the United States Constitution uh, rather repeatedly. And I hear my colleagues, I respect all of you um, uh, for your differences and our ideological differences. But the simple fact of the matter is many of you talk about the Constitution as if or uh, you really do understand all uh, the dynamics. Let me go immediately to the case um, uh, that dealt with the line item veto. That was Clinton versus uh, uh, New York. And it doesn't have a single solitary application in the situation um, uh, that is uh, before us. Um, uh, that case uh, was ruled to be unconstitutional because um, it let the president amend federal law without congressional uh, action. In this instance, I would urge my colleagues to understand uh, that the House will vote on um, uh, the Senate bill. And therefore, all of the uh, rhetoric that you can employ, all of the reasoning that you can come forward with will not change the process. I do wish to go back and as my friend, a uh, good friend from California, leaves the room. Um, I will take the prerogative, especially now that he has left the room, of um, <laughs> pointing out that just recently he made the statement that this is unprecedented and outrageous. Well, evidently, he didn't remember uh, the 104th and 109th Congresses. Mr. McGovern and I were here with Ms. Slaughter. Uh, and Ms. Matsui, and we labored those eight years uh, under uh, Mr. Dreyer's uh, rule and tutelage and giving him credit for having extraordinary capabilities when it comes uh, to this process. But let me tell you what he said on a given day um, in uh, one of those Congresses. Um, he said um, uh, that self-executing rules um, are often used and often misunderstood. That's from Mr. Dreyer. Often used and often misunderstood. Um, additionally, uh, he made the proclamation um, uh, that occasionally, and I'm quoting him, a self-executing rule may also provide for the adoption of other unrelated measures or actions, such as adopting another simple resolution bill, joint resolution, or conference report. In essence, what we have here is a conference report without members of the House and the Senate sitting down all together. But now let's say what the Constitution says and get it on the record uh, uh, clearly uh, so that we have no problems. Article 1, Section 5 of the United States Constitution says that each House may determine the rules of its proceedings. Now, Article 1, Section 7 says, every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the United, President of the United States. And it goes on to talk about veto powers, 
which are not necessarily relevant in this case. What is relevant is that whether you look at it from the standpoint of uh, just one little aspect of uh, numbers, uh, it is not unprecedented for us to undertake this particular process. <laughs> and what you need to know is that the Senate uh, bill should pass the House and go to the President for his signature before the Senate acts on reconciliation. And basically, that's what we've done here. We say that when the process is concluded, and it has not been yet, I might add, uh, it will guarantee that the Senate bill cannot pass without the improvements. Now, that's where we are. Admittedly, we leave ourselves um, uh, to the tender mercies of the other body. And the great hope is uh, that there will be some understanding uh, that they will be able to uh, uh, proceed in the manner as uh, signified. In that respect, House um, uh, Democrats, as I say, still have to trust them. Uh, and as for transparency, the rule, rule presumably will make clear that the vote on the reconciliation package is, in effect, also a vote on the underlying uh, Senate bill. And that's in accordance with the Constitution. A single bill will have passed both houses. I don't know that that helps, but I do know, uh, as my colleague from California said, uh, that um, uh, often these rules are used and often misunderstood. And therefore, I hope that we would stop all of the rhetoric and get to the business of uh, what's at hand. The fact of the matter is that a lot of our fellow Americans are hurting. And they don't have um, affordable health care. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why we all um, uh, should not be willing to share in order to help the least of us. I wish that I had been there when Thomas Edison made um, uh, the remark that I think applies here. And there ain't no rules around here. We're trying to accomplish something. And therefore, when the deal goes down, uh, all of this talk about uh, rules, we make them up as we go along. And I'm here now 18 years, and a significant amount of that time here on this committee under the leadership of the Republicans who at no time, even when they claim all they did for the prescription drugs, they left that big old donut hole in, and they never talk about the fact that they did not pay for it while they are here now becoming fiscal conservatives. One of the brightest minds in this country is Paul Ryan, for whom I have great respect. I think Paul is onto um, uh, something that may be beneficial for us at some time. But then I want to clear up one more thing, and that is this business of bipartisanship. It's as if you all were not in Mr. Miller's Education and uh, uh, Labor Committee, or uh, 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 that you were not in the Commerce Committee, or that you were not in the Ways and Means Committee, or the Budget Committee. All of those committees have had umpty umpty <laughs> hearings on this matter. And many Republican measures were passed on voice vote, so it's how the American people that you all are so want to talk about, understand, uh, were passed on voice vote and some were voted on that are Republican measures that are included in this substantive legislation that went to the Senate that we are now going to concur in and require under reconciliation that they make improvements along the lines of much of the criticism that you have offered. I think what needs to be understood is there's probably very little that we could possibly do, or the Senate. It's as if the Senate Republicans did not have anything to do with health care, and that none of their measures are involved in this process. That is wrong. They have a lot to do. But every time we do whatever it is that the Republicans want, they still vote against the bill. And then they wind up voting even in committee against the measure after they have gotten what they wanted in the provision in committee. So when we get to the floor, please, American public, understand that the Republicans have been involved. And let's give President Obama some credit. 
Never in the history of this country has anybody invited Republicans and Democrats that was President of the United States to the White House to sit down in virtually an all-day conference and have a discussion about this matter. And some of you were in um, uh, that room. I'm rank and file, so I wasn't there, and I guess uh, that was a good thing. I want to end with this. We quote Martin Luther King an awful lot about a lot of things. But I'd ask you all to understand the number of people whose homes have been foreclosed on, the number of children that are going to be helped with this measure um, uh, immediately that have pre-existing um, uh, conditions. I ask you to think about the person that, as we speak, has lost his or her job and does not have insurance. All of these things will not be remedied overnight and none of them could possibly be remedied by the federal government. I've tried to put to rest the notion about uh, the federal government takeover. The federal government runs the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, <laughs> the Pentagon. All of those are government-run programs. And I don't know too many people in here who didn't have a mama, aunt, sister, brother, cousin, or father, or mother that did not rely at some point in his or her lifetime on some of those all matters of the federal government. Martin Luther King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Today and tomorrow, and I believe history will record that Democrat did something, Democrats did something for the least of us in our society, and it was the right thing to do. And I ask my colleagues, whose side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on the side of the insurance companies? Or are you going to be on the side of the American public? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sessions of Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we have an opportunity while on this committee to uh, offer our own opinions, and I think it's a misnomer for anyone to say that uh, this is about insurance. Uh, what this bill is about is about how the government will play out the health care system uh, to all of Americans. And uh, I have several questions that I'd like to go through. The first observation I'd like to make is that Sitting on this panel, uh, sometimes I've not had problems, but I don't think it's been straightforward. When we talk about the bill, sometimes we talk about what might be the Senate bill and sometimes the House bill, and we mix those up about what's in the bill and what's actually going to be voted on. So the first question I'd like to ask each of you, uh, as you choose to, because I think it's a huge issue for this body. Uh, that, that we should have, despite us knowing what's in it or not, I think the debate should have taken place about the Gatorade, the corn, corn husker kickback, and the Louisiana Purchase. The reason why I say this is because that will be something that will be in this bill that will be voted on that will provide a specific state or area with something that no one else gets. And I believe that that is not only horrible legislation, I believe in some ways it's been uh, amounted to uh, a, a payoff uh, uh, that I do not think that is correct. And so I think this body at some point ought to have a, a discussion about that. Gentlemen, Mr. Barton, do you have an opinion about that? Before Mr. Andrews, I did offer amendments on behalf of myself and Congressman Johnson of the Ways and Means Committee to. Uh, uh, have a vote to strike those. So we have specific amendments for each of those special deals uh, pending before the committee. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sessions, the uh, special treatment for Nebraska is in the Senate bill. It is removed by the reconciliation bill. The special treatment for Florida under Medicare Advantage is in the Senate bill. It is removed by the reconciliation bill. I would disagree with the characterization of the Louisiana provision in the following way. The Louisiana provision says that any jurisdiction that suffers disasters as defined in that section qualifies for higher Medicaid reimbursement rates. It is not limited solely to Louisiana. Now, 
I hope and pray that Louisiana is the only state that gets it because we don't have that kind of calamity uh, elsewhere in the country. But if, God forbid, we did, the Medicaid reimbursement would be eligible to other states as well. Could I comment on what he just said? They say that they've eliminated the Nebraska provision. They haven't eliminated it. They've kept it and, and given it to every other state in the nation. Well, so for the first four years of the program, uh, every person who comes on to Medicaid who hasn't already been on Medicaid is 100% paid for by the federal government. Beginning in 2014, that subsidy phases out. So what you're going to see is I think many states like Arizona already has are going to begin to drop Medicaid coverage for their citizens, and we're going to make what used to be uh, a 50 percent, 50 percent federal state program, a 100 percent federal program for people below 133 percent, in this case, of poverty. Mr. Session, if I may, I think this is a better chance to avoid that, what my friend Mr. Barton just said. The criticism of the Nebraska bill, which, uh, provision, which I think is extremely well-founded, I think it was a terrible idea, that's why we're taking it out of the bill, is that only Nebraska gets the benefit of the bargain. What the uh, reconciliation bill says is that because we're insuring new people under Medicaid, these are people, you know, families making $27,000, $28,000 a year, individuals making less than that, who don't have insurance, the federal government is picking up 100% of that cost for every state for the outset and then eventually scaling that back to 90%. The criticism of the Nebraska provision was that you know, it, it benefited Nebraska in a way that not everyone else got the benefit of. Uh, that's not the case, and I think it's quite accurate to say the Nebraska provision is out of the bill. You know, I think it's interesting, this is just my, one person's observation, that, that uh, this was done to get votes to pass the bill. And yet, essentially, <laughs> very straight up, what we're trying to do is avoid a conference where both bodies have to get together and come to an agreement. Would, would the gentleman yield? I would yield to the gentleman. Yeah, I, I, I guess you mentioned conference. I mean, part of the problem here is that your counterparts, your Republican counterparts in the Senate, won't allow us to go to conference. I mean, you, you know, they're obstructing kind of the regular order. So the deal is... We claim in my time, uh, I, my observations are this is no different than a lot of other bills that have taken place, but it's a part of the process. And the process, what we're doing is we're... <clears throat> doing what I consider to be a uh, banana republic uh, type of workaround uh, rather than going straight after what it is. Gentlemen, Mr. King. Mr. Mr. Sessions, uh, there is a special tax deal for unions in the plan. Uh, they tax um, quote unquote Cadillac or high end plans beginning in 2018. And for everybody in America, that will be if their plan, if their family has the value of $27,500 or an individual, it would be $10,200. But what this bill does is says if you're an individual or a family, if you're in a union, you don't pay taxes until $27,500. So there's a special tax provision that applies to union only. Yeah. There's also a... Well, well look, Mr. Essence, I, I understand, I understand Mr. that is in the record. The rec Thank you. If I could just finish, I have several other you're, points. You're talking about both bills or... The reconciliation no bill. Reconciliation. This is uh, not in the Senate bill. They changed that. Uh, there also is a special provision for Libby, Montana, where regardless of age, everyone qualifies for Medicare. Uh, for everybody else in the country, you have to become a senior in order to qualify for Medicare. Well, do, the reconciliation... Why do you, would you think that was? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a special, uh, special provision for the citizens of that state, uh, that particularly that city in that a state. Republican senator that requested that. There's a there's a special also. Is that a Republican? No, no, I'm sure not. Uh, there's also a special provision in the Senate bill for a University of Connecticut hospital uh, that they receive a hundred million dollars. Um, there's a special provision in there for Tennessee, for Tennessee only, where Tennessee receives uh, full Medicaid disproportionate share funding. Uh, that is special to that state alone. The reconciliation bill also appears to have a special carve out uh, for uh, North Dakota. And that, uh, well, most uh, most government subsidies to banks would be eliminated for student loans. But the Bank of North Dakota 
will continue to receive federal assistance for the student loan program, while banks all over the country won't be able to do that. So uh, there's a number of special provisions that we're aware of that uh, are still remain in this legislation. Mr. Sessions, would you yield? I, I would yield to the gentleman from New Jersey. I'd like to respond to my friend uh, David Camp's points. Um, the, um, the reconciliation bill, which will be the final product, does not distinguish in any way between union and non-union workers. The excise tax applies equally to union and non-union workers. It is correct the Senate bill makes that distinction. It's my understanding, but it's corrected by the reconciliation bill, which is why we want to do it. With respect to the, the uh, issue about Connecticut's hospital, 12 states are eligible for that funding. It will be rewarded on a competitive basis. That is in the reconciliation bill, but it's not an earmark. The gentleman mentioned North Dakota in the student loan program. Um, there was an understanding that uh, state higher education guarantee agencies needed to be afforded the chance to continue to do the excellent work they do for students. So those public authorities throughout the, the country were given that opportunity. Because the North Dakota a bank serves that same function in North Dakota, it is functionally the same as that agency, it was given the same treatment that New Jersey's agency would be or California's agency would be and so forth. And I don't, I don't, in the manager's amendment, excuse me, yes, in, in the manager's amendment. So this, this notion that there's special treatment, uh, come back to that, under the excise tax for collective bargain workers is simply not accurate. I'd like to ask the gentleman if he could please provide a copy of the uh, manager's amendment Mr. to Sessions. this committee. It's uh, under testimony. Uh, Madam Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. I could answer that question if you, I, I was going to point that out if you'll yield to me. I, I would yield. I was going to go after okay. Mr. Blown. So with and the, the I'll come back. I'm looking at the bill itself, HR 47, I mean 4872. Uh, let me refer you to page 82 and 83. Page 82 is where the subtitle E begins, provisions relating to revenue. Uh, section 1401, high cost plan excise tax. There you will see the reference. You, if you go to page 83, lines, essentially line six down through about uh, 23, you'll see the language that relates to the excise tax on those employee yeah. benefits. Yes, of course. I believe that's already on the website. That's yeah, correct. It uh, is. Mr. Pallone, you were in reference to the manager's amendment. I'd like to ask the gentlewoman, the, Mr. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Andrews, I'd like to ask the uh, uh, chairman of the committee, that, have we been provided this uh, manager's amendment yet? We are waiting still for the CBO, which, as I understand, I got a note here a few minutes to be here shortly. Let, let me, if, if I might, well, my, Mr. Yeah, Sessions, I'll, just I'll to clarify it. the point on the manager's, on the manager's amendment, I think uh, Mr. Anderson misspoke. I have requested, as chair of the committee, I requested that that language be struck in the manager's amendment. I assume that will be included, but I haven't seen the manager's hey, amendment. And, That's and I, I appreciate the gentleman. Thank the you, gentleman, Mr. Chairman. I didn't I think, and I apologize. I, I think my point might be that there is conversation at the table among people who are here to give testimony, and evidently you're able to give testimony about the bill and speak about it to the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee does not have a copy of that. You don't have, a, I assume our members, Mr. Barton, uh, Mr. Ryan, our members don't have a copy of this uh, package, which is not double secret. I mean, th th this happens on a regular basis where there's a manager's amendment, but the gentleman's able to offer an explanation, and we've not been given that latitude. And More I, of a forecast than an explanation. You're going to forecast. Great. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sessions, could I, I, I? The gentleman, Mr. Plone, did ask for time. I, I just wanted to point out, I know you said before that these were special deals that were uh, in order to obtain members' votes. How would you? I think that's, I, it may have been true uh, when the bill passed the Senate. I'm not going to argue that. But what I th would like to stress, I think my colleagues have, but I'd like to point out, is that we were very careful in putting the reconciliation package together to review those. And the only cases now where a state, for example, Louisiana or Tennessee that you mentioned, is getting some different treatment, I wouldn't call it special treatment, is because it's justified in terms of a, a good government analysis, not because we're trying to obtain someone's vote, you know, as in the case of Nebraska. So, you know, with the case of Louisiana, that was, other ones like Nebraska were eliminated. Louisiana was not because you had Hurricane Katrina, and it was justified under the circumstances because of the loss of Medicaid funds. 
and it would apply to anyone else who falls into that category in the case of a disaster. And you also mentioned Tennessee, and it, it's true that in the bill, you have both Tennessee and Hawaii um, are, are the only two states, um, because they don't have an allotment of federal Medicaid disproportionate share or DISH funds, they are getting some additional help. But that's because they have no funds under DISH, and they need it in order to you know, pay for their safety net hospitals that they have. So what I would, what I would try to say to you is, there may be circumstances in here where one state is treated differently, but it's not in an effort to obtain votes, which may have been the case on the Senate side. It's an effort to correct that and do it based on a good government analysis in every case. And I think that's a, a fair way to look at it, uh, rather than you know pick out and say, well, this state's different in this respect. It's not because we're trying to get anybody's vote. So, so in other words, though, the, the, the good government bill probably will not ever become law. And the bad government, if we were to turn around, Bill. No, no. Uh, no, no. I'm saying that these reconciliation well, I'm amendments. I'm just using your terms. The good government bill. I'm saying the good government bill becomes law once you pass the reconciliation amendments. Yes, and well, eliminates I, 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 eliminates some of these problems that you're citing that were based on you know someone got a special deal because they wanted that, their vote. Yes, that that would then probably presumably become law. I'd like to go, and and I mentioned I had. Uh, three things I want to talk about. I'd like to go to the next subject, if I could, and and probably, Mr. Ryan, perhaps um, you would recognize this, and I will uh, make this available to the clerk so that each and every one of the uh, panelists can have a copy here. Uh, but there has been a discussion about. I'm sorry to the uh, to the to the uh, people to who are on the panels. And if, they, if others need a copy, I'll be glad to make Xeroxes available. But there's a, a talk about the life cycle or extension of the life cycle on a Medicare that was the gentleman, Mr. Waxman. Insolvency, right. The solvency. Right. The gentleman, Mr. McGovern, have related uh, about how great this Senate bill is, I assume we're talking about, related to uh, that solvency. Does <coughs> Mr. Ryan have any comment? I, I, I know these are probably... Budget. Sure. This spreadsheet's an inch, uh, a coverage spreadsheet, but that's that's not the Medicare numbers. But um, if you look at the letter uh, I got from the CBO yesterday, which I inserted in the record earlier uh, this morning, page four, let me just quote from you the Congressional Budget Office's uh, ruling, so to speak, on whether or not uh, the Medicare cuts in this bill extend its solvency. Uh, in effect, I'm quoting here, in effect, the majority of the HI trust fund savings under H.R. 3590 and the reconciliation proposal would be used to pay for other spending and therefore would not enhance the ability of the government to pay for future Medicare benefits. I mean, that pretty much makes the point right there, which is you, you can't count money twice. Either you're taking $523 billion out of Medicare, you know, providers and whatever you're doing, and it's going toward its solvency, or you're using it to create this new entitlement program. Not both. It's $1 comes into the government, and it goes one way or the other, it doesn't go two ways. And so $523 billion are coming out of the Medicare program and going to fund this new entitlement, and the CBO certified it as recently as yesterday. Can I respond to that? Sure. In a, in I, I, I would ask the gentleman. Yes. I, I would like to respond to that in a very general way, and it's kind of my philosophy for this whole bill and what we're doing uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, you say you can't count things twice. You know, you talk about CBO. I think you can count things many times for the following reason. The CBO takes no consideration from the overall impact of this bill if, from a preventative perspective. In other words, I believe, and there are many commentators out there beyond the CBO that say that because of what we're doing in this bill, covering everyone, filling the donut hole, um, letting people get primary care, the amount of savings to the government and the system over the long term are going to be trillions and trillions of dollars beyond what the CBO estimates because people who don't get their drugs now because they meet the, the donut hole problem or you know, people that don't have insurance and don't go to a doctor on a regular basis or people that don't get preventative care because of a copay because remember we eliminate copays for preventative care. All those things are going to me mean that people get to see a doctor get their drugs, get their medication, 
on a regular basis, and over the life of this program, you're going to save millions of dollars to Medicare, to Medicaid, to the federal government, to the system as a whole. So I, don't, I understand what you're trying to say. You can't count twice. I think you can count this two, three, four times because of the overall impact to the system and the amount of money that we're going to save, and CBO will never score that. I'm just but not going to I'll, I'll let it stand at that then. <laughs> so I, I would just say to the gentleman uh, who I don't know if he was up here when we went through the uh, stimulus bill, but I uh, asked the question to then uh, the, the gentleman, Mr. Rangel, and about what kind of report would offer economic outlook report on jobs and things that would happen. He told me, Mr. Sessions, within a matter of months, you'll see millions and millions of jobs created here in this country. Uh, I, I, I hope you're better at, at, at guessing that than Mr. Rangel was, because he came without anything to support that theory. Uh, I'd like to then go to, as part of that, then the uninsured. We've heard about how Everybody talks about where everybody's going to be insured. We heard Mrs. Uh, uh, Slaughter mention 95 percent. It looks like that around 2014, there will be 31 million people uninsured and about 23 million uninsured in 2019. Can anybody accurately discuss who those people are? Uh, Mr. That's Sessions, the paper yield, that we were passing out. The, the budget coverage funds. question about the, those who are yes. eligible but not insured. They're essentially, um, it would be people who are eligible for, to enroll but who do not. It was on this sheet of paper that I passed yeah, out. No, also. I understand. You mentioned. There's, first of all, I, I'm assuming your question excludes the undocumented because, as you know, they're not covered by the bill. You know, I would just say that, as best I can tell you, I was looking at this sheet of paper. Okay. I, I don't know that I the, knew all the assumptions. Here, here's what. Would. Here's what the, the, the uh, my understanding is. Undocumented people are, in, are ineligible, so they would remain uninsured. Uh, citizens and documented people, each of them is eligible to become insured, but in fact, not all will take advantage of that opportunity, just like there's universal free public education, but there's also truancy. This is the CBO's best guess as the number of people who have the opportunity to enroll but in fact will not do so. The fact of the matter is under this bill, meaning the, the Senate bill and the reconciliation bill, every person who is either a citizen or a legal resident of the United States will have the opportunity to, attain, to obtain health insurance, 100 percent. Mr. Sessions, if I may. Yes, Mr. Brady. I think the point you're trying to make here is that while this is uh, claimed to be universal coverage, you'll have a population the size of Texas floating through the country uninsured, even after spending uh, trillions of dollars, new subsidies, new taxes, new mandates, a whole new government bureaucracy. And that will still drive up emergency room costs, health care costs. There will still be that payment shifting and, and a major burden on the United States. And however you tend to describe it, uh, clearly, what we saw in Massachusetts when they uh, sought universal coverage was a higher premium costs, a higher government spending. They've already, after two and a half years, started to ration care at certain hospitals and with certain uh, population groups just in two and a half years. They saw the result of that. And so I think that's your concern. They're not only not covering uh, all Americans uh, clearly. Uh, but they're also driving those costs up for those who have health care. Well, Evidently, Mr. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested. Rationing care, where, where is that happening? Well, they already began uh, four months ago. Doing what? Limiting payments to certain hospitals within Massachusetts. I, I think you're in cutting problem, benefits. No, I, I Look, apologize. The Massachusetts but, model is not perfect, but the, the goal to uh, the goal to ensure does Massachusetts is, is, have is, the is, highest health care premiums I, in America? I, I, I don't, I, Today. I, I don't think so. Compared, it does. Compared to some of the other states. Has it already begun what, one, one cutting the, payments One of these Massachusetts is while we're, while, while, we're paying, while we're paying for health insurance, for, while people are paying their own health insurance in Massachusetts, we're also paying for the health insurance of people in Texas As who do not get it and who end up for health care uh, lower. Let me, let me finish my sentence, please. Sure. We in Massachusetts have attempted universal coverage. Everybody has to get health, everybody should have health care. People are paying for health care in Massachusetts, but we're also paying for health care for people in Texas, people who may be well able to afford insurance, who choose not to get it, who get sick and go to the hospital, and that's all uncompensated care, and we pay for it. One of the ways to control health care costs 
is to make sure people have coverage. One of the reasons why it's difficult for us to be able to control health care costs as much as we would like is we're paying for you people in your state who don't have coverage. So you're you saying have, you're there one is, of the highest uninsured is, states in the country, am I right? So you still have the highest health care premiums in America. Okay. There's cost shifting from the government to the private pay. And then finally, has health care spending been reduced in Massachusetts as a result of your plan? The, uh, uh, the, the plan is, just, is uh, working. The just plan a is yes working, no. Mr. Brady. It, it's not perfect, but the way it ultimately works is if everybody else in this country, every other state, your state is like, has one of the high, I think one of the highest uninsured Look, populations. The, I'd in the be country. embarrassed I mean, if I had the job. highest health care premiums. I, I, don't, I don't want to trade with Texas. The, plan. the answer is yes. They do have the highest premiums. We'll see the same. I'll reclaim my time. Please do. I, I think that... <laughs> you know, there's a lot of points that could be made here. The only thing I could say is when given an opportunity, uh, the people of Massachusetts, I think, have voted overwhelmingly across the state to elect a person who would come to Washington to oppose that great plan that might be same or similar to what they are doing. If the gentleman yield, the senator voted Excuse for the me, plan. Mr. Session, Mr. Brown voted, Mr. Brown voted for the Massachusetts health care plan. To, to not replicate yeah, well, anything like well, what they He have. voted for the plan. Would the gentleman yield? I, I, I would yield to the gentlewoman from North Carolina. Well, I want to just um, put, add a point about uh, what my colleague, Mr. Sessions, is saying, that there's an article in the Boston Globe on Wednesday, uh, quote, State Treasurer Timothy P. Cahill of Massachusetts saying... If President Obama and the Democrats repeat the mistake of the health insurance reform here in Massachusetts on a national level, they will threaten to wipe out the American economy within four years. And then he goes on to say, it's time for the president and Democratic leadership to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new plan that does not threaten to bankrupt this country. So I think there are people uh, who share the same concern uh, Mr. Sessions, who live in Massachusetts, Could I? who serve in public office. Well, the general lady yield. And it was a major. Not I would, my time. I, would, I, would, I, I, I want to. I would yield. I, 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 I want to say that I think the majority of people in Massachusetts would not want to repeal the health insurance system that we have put in place. I also point out that that same insurance system uh, was 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 voted in favor of by Senator Brown, number two. And the other thing, in terms of costs, our costs have risen more slowly than any other state. In this country, if we can get a, a, a comprehensive plan in place, it'll, it'll save us from paying for the people in your state who can afford insurance, who choose not to get it, and when they get sick, it's, we end up having to pay for it. I'd like to engage gentleman. the gentleman. What do you, when you're talking about the people in Massachusetts paying for Texans who choose not to have coverage because we have high rates of un, 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 uninsured, what, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that when people go into a hospital without insurance, it costs money. It's uncompensated care. That's what they call it. And that uncompensated care, whether it's in Texas or anywhere else, you know, someone pays for it. Who pays for it? We pay for it in the form of federal taxes. We pay for it because it, what we don't pay for it goes on the debt, and we pay for our, we pay for it in the interest on our debt. So this the fact the uncompensated care pool in this country is one of the reasons why we see our deficits going out of control. So we, we're paying for you, uh, for your state, uh, Mr. S Sessions, I, like for, for being one of the worst uh, uh, so states in the country. So somebody reimbursing this uncompensated dish? Sure. Well, why are so many people going through bankruptcy if somebody paid the bill? Mr. Sessions, uh, I, oh, but who did? Mr. Session, they might have put the first part of it on the credit right. card, you know, because they didn't have insurance, so they ran it up the credit card, oh, look, and they're in, they're in, they're in the bankruptcy. Right. And I the respond. Fact of the matter is, every ask any insurance company. There's an uninsured, uncompensated care that's added to everybody's mm -hmm. premium in this country. I believe that's that. That's why businesses are dropping right. insurance. That's why people right. come to Washington from large businesses to small businesses. I tell you, the current system is broken and unsustainable. Well, let me next this thing out, out if I can. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to reclaim my time. I'm going to net this thing out, and I'm going to show you the way I look at this sheet of paper. The way I look at this sheet of paper is today there are 50 million people who are not covered, and in 2019 there will be 23. So if you subtract that out, you're, we're looking at all this stuff that we're doing to take care of half the people who are uninsured today. 
And we're talking about what I believe the first three years, I believe CBO bears this out, we're going to lose 5 million more jobs to pay for this. Depends probably which bill you go in, Mr. Perlmutter. If you go in the Senate bill, maybe one, perhaps in, in the House side another. What I'm saying is that 3 million will take your figure. 3 million people are going to lose their job to take care of 27 million people who then will be covered. And I think that that is a horrible way to look at how you balance out this big effort and what we're trying to do. And the last time we I was led to believe, proposal I appreciate the, the gentleman. House, I, there are 10 million new uninsured I, at the end of the decade under your proposal. And, and I appreciate that that uh, help, Mr. Miller, but the bottom line is we're talking about your two bills. And your two bills, we've been selling out there that we're going to take care of everybody, but what we're doing this for is about 27 million people and three, are going, three more are going to have to lose their job. We're going to put this huge system on top of everybody. The gentleman yield. And I will yield to the gentleman, Mr. Pallone. Look, uh, again, I, don't, I know you, you've got these figures in your mind about... No, no well, sir, they're right here. I understand They're that. right there. That's but again, what I would point Mr. out... That's document. When you're, when you're going to cover all these people and they're going to have to... They're going to go to primary care, they're going to see a doctor, they are going to be a lot more health care professional jobs are going to be created to take care of all that primary care, to deal with all these people that now have health insurance. And I really wanted to respond when you yield to Dr. Fox, because the bottom line is you, you suggested that, you know, we're headed towards bankruptcy or whatever. Look, that's what's happening under the status quo. The status quo now, more and more people aren't going to have insurance. Premiums are going up 20, 30 percent. The, the percentage of the gross national product that's devoted to health care keeps climbing. It's twice what it is in any other developed country. If we don't do anything, I have no doubt we're going to be bankrupt. But here we are proposing a very rational way of trying to correct the system and put a lot more of those people that would eventually be uninsured and give them insurance, uh, try to control these, these increases, not have a 20 or 30 percent increase like we're seeing now, and covering everybody. So, you know, I, I just don't understand. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's almost like you say that the status quo is acceptable and things are going to get better on their own. They're not. They're going to get worse Mr. and they Sessions, continue you know, to get worse. My time. And we've I, got to come up with a solution. You may not think this is a perfect solution, but it's, it's so much better than the, the status quo. I, I appreciate it's just so gentleman, much better. I appreciate the gentleman, but no one is suggesting status quo. No, I understand, not but I'm trying to point here, out. One person here, Mr. Plum, I understand that. I'm simply saying I don't think that this... But if we don't if do Mr. anything, would yield, if, if we don't do would something... Time, Mr. Pallone, I've, I've, I, I know it is, and we, we really have to uh, uh, and I, work with And I want if people to stop talking over each other. It's always been polite up here. We work it very well. This is the only committee, as you know, that goes on forever. <laughs> we have no time limit really? on anyone. We would like it very much. Oh, thank you. We yes. would appreciate it very much if you would limit yourselves uh, to some degree because we have a very long and heavy day ahead of us. But please ask for and receive the ability to speak before you all start talking at once. I, Mr. I, Sessions. I agree with that. Thank you for uh, reclaiming my time. The last issue that I wanted to get into was directly related to the physician reimbursement called SGR. And I am aware that uh, we had a 21% cut that took place in March. I know that was about a $280 billion fix. <coughs> Uh, that is already in place. Uh, we're seeing a number of physicians that are deciding they will not uh, take care of uh, Medicare patients as a result of this. Uh, we now, if you add the 21 percent and trying to fix whatever we're told it might be, uh, $523 billion instead of $280 billion. It is not in the bill, but it's a cost to the system. And I'm concerned that we're not right-sizing this thing. Mr. Henseling, you've been through this in the Budget Committee. I'd appreciate your take on that. Well, I, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I listened carefully to the gentleman from New Jersey, and I'm glad he has concern about the nation going bankrupt, which makes me question why would you want to enact a policy that simply stamps on the accelerator towards bankruptcy? I know that earlier today, many people on your side of the aisle are waving around a Congressional Budget Office letter. 
uh, talking about, well, we're going we're to save money. We're somehow going to reduce the deficit uh, through these policies. Uh, CBO is, is, is made up of great professionals, but they only estimate, or as we call it, score what's before them. And guess what? If you don't put before them the doc fix, they don't score it. Now, already the Speaker of the House has said there will be a doc fix, that physicians will not receive a 21 percent pay cut on Medicare reimbursements. The Speaker said that on the record. Uh, so the ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Ryan of Wisconsin, asked the CBO, okay, well, the Speaker has said we're, we're not going to have the 21 percent pay cut, and I will read from this letter. I, I trust it's already been entered into the record, but it's a letter dated March 19th from the Congressional Budget Office uh, to the Honorable Paul Ryan, and I will read the, uh, the operative language. Quote, you ask about the total budgetary impact of enacting the reconciliation proposal, the Senate passed health bill, and the Medicare Physicians Payment Reform Act. CBO estimates that enacting all three pieces of legislation would add I emphasize the word add $59 billion to budget deficits over the 2010-2019 period. Uh, so I have my own letter from the Congressional Budget Office, and frankly, this is, as the gentleman from Texas knows, it's just one of the many budgetary gimmicks uh, that are being used here. Uh, and I'm sure that people's hearts are pure, I'm sure their minds are clear, uh, but their accounting would make Bernie Madoff blush. We're talking about 10 years of revenues matched up against six years of program. Uh, every single decade does the Democratic majority intend on turning off this program uh, for four years. Uh, after this year, then are you going to have your 21, 22, 23 uh, percent pay cut for doctors under the Medicare system? You're claiming Medicare savings twice, on your revenue side, you're claiming $520 billion in Medicare cuts, $210 billion in new Medicare taxes, but this is double accounting. You can't have it both ways. Either that money is used for the solvency of the Medicare system or it's being used for your new entitlement. That brings us to the Class Act, the new entitlement that you're putting into this program. Five years of premium, $70 billion that you are taking out of your brand new entitlement to use to reduce the cost of this. So are you going to pay it back? Even the Democratic head of the Senate Budget Committee said, quote, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is the Democratic chairman of the Senate Budget Committee described this scheme as a Ponzi scheme. Raids on Social Security. Uh, $53 billion in new Social Security reve uh, revenue to achieve the appearance of deficit cuts, but they're not really there. Are you saying that you're going to permanently take this money out of the Social Security Trust Fund and not replace it? I mean, again, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that I have a program that's going to reduce the deficit unless you own up to the fact that you're going to cut doctors' pay 21 percent in the Medicare system create a new entitlement, yet you're not going to fund it. You're going to yet again raid the Social Security Fund and not replace that revenue. I mean, again, it's just not realistic. Oh, and the donut hole. The donut hole doesn't get scored until the next decade. Uh, it is totally unrealistic. Again, this is no, they're casting no aspersions on the Congressional Budget Office, but they score what's in front of them. Now, I could go to the Congressional Budget Office and say, I want you to score the Henserling Family Health Care Plan, and I want you to assume that I don't get sick for the next 10 years and my wife and I are putting our children up for adoption, can you give me the number? Well, one assumption is false and the other assumption is totally unrealistic. So CBO will score what's before them. Now that the speaker is set on the record, there will be a doctor fix. You cannot count the 21% pay cut. Thus, thus, Congressional Budget Office says, that you are making the deficit worse, and you are hastening the road to bankruptcy. Thank you. I appreciate Mr. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Sessions. I'd like to go to gentleman, Mr. Andrews. Mr. Henserling is telling 10 years of a 20-year story. What was before the CBO is the full 
20 years of the Class Act. What was before the CBO was the full 20 years of the revenue and the spending. And what the CBO said, and it, it's, I find it somewhat remarkable that what my friend seems to be saying is that we agree with the CBO except for when we disagree with them. So Mr. Ryan gets a letter from the CBO, it's like a stone tablet from Mount Sinai, but when we have one, it's somehow invalid. I think they're both valid. But I would say to, to my friend through Mr. Sessions that the CBO looked at the full 20 years and they said that the deficit will be reduced by between three-tenths, I believe three-tenths and five-tenths of GDP, about $1.2 trillion over the 20 years. That was what was before them. That's what they concluded. And you just can't say we believe them when we like what they say and we don't believe them when we don't like what they Rob, say. I've got That's a what question. they said. Are you suggesting then that in that number that you're talking about, that the doc fix of the... No, sir. I did not we, say that. Okay, so, so the, see, this is, goes back to my point, that you, you, we're looking at a system today that's got to be reformed. Does the, does the gentleman support the, the doctor fix? What, what the, of course I support the doctor fix. How would the gentleman pay for it? Well, let, let, let's just go to... I think you ought to pay for it, and I think you ought to How? be honest. Well, that first, for, you know what? We can do that just fine, and we'll do it next year when we're in the majority then. Okay. You just watch but, but can you put but it the gentleman from New Jersey be, Watch it. That? I sure will. But my point, I know it's $580 billion because, or $523 billion because we're taking it and spending it somewhere else, and it's a matter of priorities. And what we're essentially doing it for is this 25 or 26 million people but still leaving 23 uh, that are not served. Would and they, this would, is where it goes to the entire system. I understand that. The entire system, Rob, if the, is, is being put if the at risk. I, I will. It's okay, my time. Thank you. Thank I you. gave the gentleman the time. I'm grateful. I am saying to you the entire system could collapse right. to cover 25 million people, and the entire system for everybody could collapse if we really add it all in together. Well, and well, the gentleman does. Will the gentleman, does, does, will, will the gentleman does, yield? Does yield that. Will the I gentleman. would yield to the Thank gentleman. You. Uh, the gentleman says he supports the doctor fix. I do. Be, which is why the American Medical Association has said very positive things about this bill. There's three ways to pay for the doctor <laughs> fix. You can find revenue, you can find spending cuts, or you can adjust the baseline and pay for it that way, which is what the present budget resolution does. Which of those do you support? Well, here's what I support. I support being honest and okay. recognizing that it may be the AMA said it's okay to take out the 21% uh, the, uh, the cut, but not one physician I've talked to is in favor of that, and that they will quit doing business for our senior citizens, and we're not doing anything that I consider to be worthy to, to avoid that circumstance. And I'm simply saying, you know, you have to evaluate what's in front of you. Right. We've said that about 10 times. My evaluation of what's in front of me is netting it all out, netting it all out. We're not going to pay the doctors. We still have $523 billion that the gentleman, Mr. Hensling, by the way, Madam Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the gentleman's letter that he read from that was Mr. Ryan be included in the Without objection. transcript. Gentlemen, I believe it's honest to net it out and say that for about 25 million people, we are going to not even put in $523 billion worth but, of real cuts that well, we the have one more time. Of, of cost that we know is going to be added in. And that is a bad proposition to then lose 3 million more jobs to get to there. I would. And I just know Mr. Just one more, and I, I promise to me too. I promise. I would just try and try this one more time. Revenues, spending cuts, or just the baseline, which do you support to pay for the doctor fix? Uh, I, I support that we should not uh, expand the system, that we should have more people pay for this system. And you know this, that Republicans, the first 50 billion would come from tort reform. And I would take the first 50 of this from tort reform, and I think that then we ought to... Where's the other 230? Well, it, it, it would be in there if we don't grow and do exactly what this okay. bill is with, doing. Would the gentleman yield to you me? You know that I could get there... My point would be, I'll go to Mr. Pallone, then I'll draw a conclusion, and then I would be pleased to yield back for your time, and I appreciate it. I hope 
This has allowed everybody an opportunity to have a full dialogue. I'll be Before the gentleman yields brief. back, would you yield? I, I would, and I know the gentleman, Mr. Hensherling, is after some. I'm, I'm going to be very brief. Look, I, I listened to uh, what Mr. Hensherling said, and the bottom line is whatever you put before the CBO in a particular bill, that's what they're going to rule on. And based on what we gave them about this bill that we're going to hopefully pass tomorrow, they said that it reduces the deficit significantly. Now. You know, the Republicans in the past, when they did the doctor fix, they didn't pay for it. Okay, it wasn't paid for. There's no reason to believe it's going to be paid for. The Iraq war wasn't paid for. So many other things were not paid for. Okay? I think that it's very unfair. I don't know, maybe that's not the correct word, but it's inaccurate or somehow unfair for, you know, either of you to come here today and say, well, what about the doctor fix? Or I could say, well, what about the war? Or what about this? And the bottom line is, we're not voting on the doctor fix today. If we vote on it, then it has to be paid for or it's going to be deficit reduction. Same thing with the Iraq war. Same thing with all these other things that end up being passed uh, without attention to the deficit. The bottom line is that this package, which we're asking you to rule on, is a significant reduction in the deficit. And it is completely paid for. And um, so I just think, you know, I, I've been trying to say from day one here that the CBO is a very artificial construct. There's no question it is. I can sit here today and prove to you that we're going to save trillions of dollars beyond what the CBO says just because they don't count preventative care and the fact that so many people are going to be able to see a doctor and not end up in the emergency room. So you can do whatever you want, but the rules are that we've got to use the CBO, and this is what the CBO says, and we're touting the fact that it's a major deficit reduction because within the confines of that CBO that you and I and all of us agree on, this is a major savings for the federal government yeah. over the lifetime and, of the and program. I appreciate, I appreciate that, Mr. Pallone, but, you know, you've argued really both sides, but you're not including the whole cost. You, you, you don't, don't you, what about, I sat here when you were in the majority for 12 years, and I'm not being disrespectful, well, I, I, but the whole time you passed all these things on and didn't pay any did. attention we to the did, deficit. but we weren't running $200 billion deficits a month. Well, I mean, the point I'm trying to say is that so it's, we had, we had it's clear that the doctor's fix is we not going to be, off the, surplus. the doctor's fix isn't going to be paid for. You know well, it, and Bill I Bill Clinton. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. Mr. Camp asked well, well, uh, for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that we did offer a proposal on the floor during the debate on this health care bill that would update the doctor payments for four years at a 2 percent increase. It was fully paid for. So the, the, the concept that we've never tried to pay for the doctor fix is just absolutely well, wrong. I wanted to correct that. We, we, did, we did pay for the updates when we were in the majority. That was abs it's absolutely wrong to say that we didn't pay for updates in the doctor fix. And, the and CBO says that if you include the, f the cost of doing that, the deficit's going to go up. And that's not even including the real cost of long-term care insurance, the real cost of the $10 billion that we know IRS is going to have to have to enforce the provisions of this bill. So there's a lot that's not in the CBO score, but we do have a letter from CBO, CBO saying if you just include that one thing, you increase the deficit. So in other words, the 16,000 new employees from the IRS that it will take to come after this, they aren't included in this bill? No, that's not included. Oh, my gosh. The gentleman, Mr. Shim. Uh, thank you, and I'll be brief also. If you cut $500 billion from Medicare and you don't do the doctor fix, how are you going to keep physicians receiving Medicare patients that you're not. you're not. You're not fixing, you're not doing the doc fix. You're cutting 500 billion from Medicare. In fact, you're double counting, as my friend Hensling uh, mentioned. You're not gonna keep them covering seniors, and that's a concern that really needs to be addressed. But may maybe that's how you pay for the bill then. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Hensling, I know, has been after me and very polite, and I appreciate my friend putting up with me. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding one more time. I would um, say to my friend from New Jersey, this friend from New Jersey, uh, number one, the assumption you make on 20 years still includes the double accounting on Medicare. You're still claiming $520 billion in Medicare cuts paired with $210 billion in new Medicare taxes that you're using twice, once for the solvency of the system and the other to pay for this. Uh, and again, you can't have it both ways. Uh, the CMS chief actuary has written, quote, in practice, the improved HI financing cannot be simultaneously used to finance other federal outlays, such as the coverage expansions, and to extend the trust fund 
despite the appearance of this result from the respective accounting conventions. I would say to my other friend from New Jersey, again, uh, what you put before CBO, yes, they will score. But to go around and, and try to entice members uh, to vote for this bill uh, when you have assumptions that are simply not true, uh, I just think is, is, is undeserving of the process of this House. I would also point out to this friend from New Jersey, since I have several friends from New Jersey, <laughs> the Congressional Budget Office it says, itself says that in the out years, <laughs> that in the out years that their estimates become even more unreliable. And I think we know through history uh, that the predecessor to the Congressional Budget Office, when they were asked to score the 30-year cost of Medicare, uh, were off by a factor of somewhere between 800 and 1,000 percent. So if this new entitlement saves money, it will be the first entitlement in the history of mankind that actually proves to save money. And, and frankly, it just defies common sense and logic that you're going to bring in 30 million some odd new people into the health care system, half of which will be on Medicaid, and at the end of the day, somehow you're going to end up saving money. Now, you may have convinced yourselves. It is clear you have not convinced the American people. I'll yield back the to the gentleman in Texas. Mr. Sarah. Oh. Mr. Yeah. Sessions, I'll be brief because I hope so. we need that to move on. Sad. I just wanted to clarify something Mr. Hensling said. Is that mic on? Yeah, I, I'll just speak a little louder. I, just how about now? As close as you can. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on something Mr. Hensling said because I think it can't, it can't go without saying. We, we can have our numbers. We can have our charts. We can talk about projections. But if we can't have an arbiter of what is the most accurate, then we're nowhere. It's a food fight. And the reality is here, each of us, Republican and Democrat, have relied for more than 30 years on the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office. Whether they're always right on the number or a little off, we rely on them because we know they're not partisan. We know that they are not biased. We know that they, they are independent. And if we can't trust them, then all bets off because there's no one that we can trust. And so I would simply say to Mr. Hensling, for Mr. Hensling to say that the numbers are not real is to impugn the reputation of the Congressional Budget Office. Well, I, let's I, stand up for my if I could, I'm going to reclaim my time because I don't believe Mr. Hensling was saying that well, at the, all. Well, if there are gimmicks, uh, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Hensling close, was saying it was I not was simply included say, in there. Mr. Sessions, if I could just conclude and say this, then let's understand that the Congressional Budget Office isn't a child. When they go through and scrub all these numbers, they make sure that they're not being hoodwinked by gimmicks and shell games. And so they came up with these numbers, not Republicans, not Democrats. And we should be able to move forward understanding what the CBO has given us. I thank the gentleman for your Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be extended two additional minutes, and I'll finish. Okay. Mr. Hensling, to one of those minutes, please. Five seconds. I trust CBO. I do not trust the assumptions you gave CBO. I'd like to yield to the gentleman, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much. And, uh, let me, let me just say that I think that what we've witnessed here, again, underscores the need for uh, an open rule and a debate on the House floor. I've, uh, <clears throat> I've listened to Mr. Pallone, and on an almost daily basis, I listen to Mrs. Slaughter, Mr. McGovern, and Mr. Hastings regularly point to the horrible things that we did as justification for the action that is about to be taken, whether it's using this process, which we use with great regularity, whether it's uh, all kinds of things. And I'd like to just share with our colleagues again the fact that when the now majority came to majority and was in the process of campaigning, they did so in large part attacking us on our record. And there was a document called A New Direction for America. And this is what Speaker Pelosi ran on in her New Direction for America. And I'd just like to share with our colleagues a couple of brief paragraphs uh, from this item. Said, bills should come to the floor under a procedure that allows open, full, and fair debate consisting of a full amendment process that grants the minority the right to offer its alternatives, including a substitute. Members should have at least 24 hours to examine bills and conference reports uh, text prior to floor consideration. Rules governing floor debate must be reported before 10 p.m. 
for a bill to be considered the following day. House Senate conference committees should hold regular meetings at least weekly of all conference committee members. All duly appointed conferees should be informed of the schedule of conference committee activities in a timely manner and given ample opportunity for input and debate of decisions as decisions are made towards the bill language. And the fact is, I mean, we regularly hear that we did something that is being done now, which was harshly criticized, and the promise that was made in a direction for America was, in fact, these things that are being subverted now. I mean, I ask about the conference well, the gentleman taking place on this. Well, Mr. Okay. Sessions just yielded to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and I, I do know that, that you'll, of course, be able to point to something that we did uh, eight years ago that didn't exactly comply with what was put forward here in a new direction for America by Ms. Pelosi. So I just would like, as we look at what's taking place here at this moment, say that an open and free-flowing debate on the floor of the United States House of Representatives is what the American people deserve, and that's what we should be doing right now. And I thank my thank friend. You. I, and I, I appreciate it, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you okay. today and to the gentleman, Mrs. Slaughter, for making sure that each of these members could be here today. They are, they're taking a lot of their weekend to come up and provide testimony. I found it very insightful. I do have friends from New Jersey, a, a place I used to live, and I enjoy New Jersey. But I think it's important that every time we do a major bill that we have experts, people who understand the bills, which has not been the case, who are able to come here, answer questions. Uh, I know you're counting votes. I'm a no vote. I yield back. <laughs> I was going to put you as undecided. Yeah. Um, I, um, I want to agree, Mr. Sessions. I mean, I think this panel um, has, been, has been terrific. I, I just want to say one thing in response to my friend, Mr. Dreyer, and that is um, we are faced with a complicated process today because Members of your party um, in the Senate have said that they will filibuster uh, the appointment of, con of, of, of conferees if we, we go to conference. I mean, I can't get around it. You need 60 votes. Uh, to, and they won't even allow us to have a vote, up or down, on this. And so, uh, I, you know, I wish, I wish things were different, but I will tell you that, you know, with respect, members of your party have made it very, very difficult by throwing roadblocks uh, at every chance they get to try to prevent us from moving this forward. Well, gentlemen, you, you know, I, I, I want an up or down vote. And, and, and I, you know, I like regular, I like an up or down vote in the Senate. It's very, very difficult. I yield to the job. I thank my friend for yielding. Let me just say again, we wouldn't need to be sitting here if we'd not had the Democrats in the Senate for years blocking our proposals for associated health plans, for our proposal to bring about real lawsuit abuse reform. They chose to it, do that, and we could have played a big so role in driving the cost so this is a of health insurance. To, no, payback no, it's not payback at all. It's simply recognizing that the idea of a 1.2, and it's a $1.2 trillion program that involves the federal government more heavily in health insurance and health care than it's ever been before is not the answer. That's, well, that's what fine. the members then, of the Senate, the Senate are saying, and we say the, the Senate, exact same thing. The Senate shouldn't I thank my friend for yielding. And the Senate shouldn't filibuster, and we could have gone regular order. With that, I'll yield to Ms. Matsui from California. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to be here. I know all of you are pleased to be here, too. And uh, we should get some better cushions probably for your chairs there. Um, I must say this is uh, an interesting time, and, uh, and I have not been here for 6, 8, 20, 30 years at all, but I'm here now, and I'm privileged to be here now to participate in especially this great bill. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, I guess, started this process, so it's been Republicans and Democrats, and I don't know when Teddy Roosevelt was president. It must have been at least 100 years ago, but we have been through this where we all as Americans felt that it was time, time to provide for our citizens, time to provide health care for our citizens. And we go up the hill and down the hill. We go up, we can't come down. We're doing this again. We're at this crest now. We can almost get there, almost get there. And we could just bring up the past as much as we can about you did this, you didn't do this, and all of this. I think we all agree that we've done things, right? But I must say that I have to tell you, each one of us in our families have had personal stories. Maybe, you know, I know I look around and, you know, when you get to talking with your colleagues on a personal basis, 
You know you've had challenges. You know that. And I must say that when you get down to that level and then you hear from your constituents, not the ones who are loud, not the ones banging on your doors, but the ones who come up to you later, the ones who write little notes to you, people do write notes, you know, the ones who call. And you know, their stories are very similar to all of ours, too. And I think each one of us, despite the great health care we have, always know that there could be the next thing there that could really wipe us out. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking care of each other here. And that's really an American tradition. And I think it's time we move on it. Now, I understand that this is a difficult, comprehensive bill. It is. I sat in the Energy and Commerce Committee hearings and subcommittee meetings and everything else, for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I think all of you did too, and in, in labor and ways and means and everywhere else. And in discussions, town halls, talking with your friends. We've done that. We've discussed all of this. It's really time to do this now. And I must say that I think each of us had the best intentions here. But we cannot just start pulling this thing apart because we know why it's hard. It's a very complicated, comprehensive system that really does touch all Americans. And we want to ensure that all Americans can be covered in some way. And we also are a free market society, so we also realize that we have a plan already as far as our private insurance and how we do things. We have Medicare. We have a few things here. But as far as putting it together, we've not done that. So it's really time to do that. Now, we can do all the good stuff and just say, oh, let's just get rid of pre-existing conditions. Let's go ahead and just get rid of lifetime caps, all that. You can't do that in isolation. We absolutely cannot do that in isolation. If we could, we could have. We would have done it already. We can't do that. So what we need to do is look at the whole picture. And I, I think I read in one of the articles that you look at health care like a three-legged stool. You know, if you just have one leg on it, you can barely balance maybe for a while. You have two legs, you have to stay a certain way. Three legs, you're finally pretty much balanced out. And that's what we're talking about, about this system. So I think it's important for us to look at the fact that this is something that the American public, and I've heard from the American public too, most of them understand that the system we have cannot go on the way it's going. They're a little afraid. You can understand that. Change is difficult. But we're trying to do this in the most reasonable way with what they know or are familiar with already. You know, they can keep their doctor. I know many of my senior citizens, can I keep my doctor? Yes, you can keep your doctor. In fact, we understand how important it is to have your doctor, and we understand how important it is to have a coordinated care. So you don't have to keep taking all these tests over and over again. We've addressed a lot of these things, and that is why it's a complicated system. So I think that it is something where we have looked at, we want to make sure it's affordable, affordable for all middle-class Americans because they're being challenged the most. We know the insurance companies have been given a free ride, so we want to hold them accountable. And we want to you know, pr you know, have accessibility for those who don't have it right now. And those are the principles that we built this upon. Now, I can't see us pulling this thing apart right now. We've gotten this far. I know there's challenges ahead here, but anything this big is going to have been taken this long. And when we make policy and we try to get it to the floor, we know it's not the most simple way at all, but this is not a simple situation at all. This is almost the last thing we can do right now for all Americans. We like to do it. Now, um, I like to see probably Mr. Pallone or Mr. Miller or Mr. Andrews, why it is so important to have the three legs, a comprehensive aspect of this bill. Can I, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know the time's running out. You talked about the system and how the system may change and how you sat through so many of our, our subcommittee hearings. 
And I know that so much of the emphasis today is on the money, and I don't want to take away from the debt and the, and the money and all that. But I think that what we're really talking about here, and so much of our hearings in Energy and Commerce was devoted to this, is a change in the way we do things. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm not trying to be critical, Mr. Hensling, but you said that, talked about the people that are outside the system, you know, who are not covered. The fact of the matter is they're in the system. They're going to the emergency room. You know, they are getting care, but they're getting the wrong kind of care at the wrong time. Um, everyone's in the system. Everybody gets health care. Nobody can be denied care if they go to an emergency room or a clinic or whatever. But we, we're trying to change the way we do things. And there hasn't been that much attention to the fact that the whole way we deliver health care is going to be changed. Uh, not not in, the, in, in the money or, or the in insurance so much, but the fact that we, it'll be preventative. People will go to see a doctor on a regular basis. They'll get the primary care. And that, you know, different innovative ways of, of trying to look at care so that it's not just one doctor here, one doctor there, but the whole system, the concept of the medical home. There's so many things like this that change the way we deliver health care that will not only save a lot of money, as I've said many times today, but also make for better quality care. And, and that's why I think, you know, when you cha say change the system, I think that's what, what President Obama was talking about. Not so much the, the dollars, but the fact that we need to do things differently. And this, whole, this turns the system uh, uh, very much away from this, and, you know, looking at when you get sick, when you go to the emergency, and back towards trying to prevent bad things from happening. Well, that's and why we have a lot of prevention in here, and too. And when people see that, they're going to love this mm -hmm. because it's such a change in the way we do things in terms of the quality and the delivery of care. I think Generally, we'll yield. Uh, we've heard almost universally across the House that people say they want to avoid discrimination based on pre-existing conditions. It's hard to find a member who says he or she's not for that. In order to accomplish that and not spike premiums for insured people, you have to have a larger pool of people that are covered eventually. You can transition into that, but eventually that's what you have to do. So then people say, well, why do you have the exchanges? Well, because when you're bringing in the larger pool of people to make the pre-existing condition work, you want to have a competitive marketplace, unlike the existing marketplaces in this country, that gets the best deal for people. And then people say, well, why do you have to have the subsidies? Well, to get people into this marketplace, if somebody's making $25,000, $35,000, $40,000 a year, you can have all the marketplaces you want, but they can't <clears> buy in without the subsidies. Then people say, why do you have to have the spending restraints and the revenue? Well, you can't have the, 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 uh, the subsidies without the spending restraint and the revenue. So I, I would say to you, to the gentlelady, that this easy answer, which is so glibly stated by people, let's just take care of the pre-existing condition problem, it doesn't fit together if you don't take the next step and the next step and the next step and make it work. The people of the country deserve more than a half-baked solution that won't work, and that's what this bill does. The gentlewoman yield. Certainly I yield. I thank my friend for yielding, and uh, I appreciate this exchange, but I just wanted to, to uh, share with our colleagues and see if there's any response to a story that has just come out from the Washington Post in the last few minutes. It says, House Democratic leaders say, uh, let's see here, House Democratic leaders say that they will take a separate vote on the Senate health care bill, rejecting an earlier much criticized strategy that would have permitted them to deem the measure passed without an explicit vote. And I just wondered if the, this is a decision that has been made by the House Democratic leadership. I know that Mr. Cardoza raised concern about it earlier. Let me, let me yield to me. Uh, as you know, we're having this hearing and we have not put a rule together, and that's the whole point of this. And at the end of the, uh, at the end of this um, hearing, we will meet and try to Sounds like it has together. happened based well, on it, the it, story it, that well, the Washington you know, Post said. They it announced it. Uh, Recla uh, reclaiming my time here. Matt, was the gentlelady yield? Yes, Dems certainly. Dems dropped the demon pass plan is what it's um, I, I believe yep. that there has been significant Man, discussion. Concerned. I want to thank the House leadership for, in fact, indicating to a number of us that that is, in fact, what's going to happen. And I, I think that um, we've had sanity prevail here, and I'm very pleased about that. It's not that, it, as I said before, it's not that it wasn't unconstitutional or illegal, but it was something that we should have just done in the light of day straight up. And I want to it praise the House that never has been done before uh, on an issue of this magnitude. Well, reclaiming my time here. Um, Mr. Miller, did you want to say something? Just to build on what uh, uh, Congressman Andrews said, we have been incrementally tinkering with this system 
for 50 years at a minimum. Uh, and so then when you want to make the kind, of, the kind of change that brings about the efficiencies in the system, the expansion of the system, and, and, and controls the utilization in terms of getting value as opposed to activity, if you don't, as Mr. Andrews said, put everybody in, it doesn't work. You know, that's from the insurance companies, that's from the medical practitioners, the providers who say to you over and over again, not necessarily agreeing with this bill, but this is what you're going to have to do. You're moving the right pieces around, whether you talk to the providers or whether you talk to the insurance industry, and again, they will, they will argue over, over bits and pieces of this. What we have is, is, to date is a history where all of the adverse indicators are just tumbling downhill. Businesses, large and small, are shedding the coverage. Small businesses are shedding the coverage. Uh, one, of the, one of the premier insurance providers, employers in our state, is now putting a sur surcharge on spouses, a surcharge on children. They're offloading, and they've been offloading for a decade, the cost to the, to the enterprise onto the employees. That is going on all the time. If you're in, a, if you're in a, an organized union, what you see is more and more is going to, is going to health care and less and less is going to, to, to discretionary income in people's pockets. So the trends are all in the wrong direction, and they're accelerating. They're absolutely accelerating in terms of, of dramatically increasing the, the uninsured. In our state today, the LA Times tells us it's one in four. They tell us there's a $1,000 cost premium on that on every Californian. So you've got to bring people into the system. You've got to drive the efficiencies. You've got to drive the savings. You've got to drive the value of the engagements that take place. And the fact of the matter is, with medical IT, with these changes, you get a dramatic change in behavior. At Kaiser Hospitals, one of the, one of the, one of the most successful enterprises, now patients are able, without getting a doctor's office visit, can ask their doctors questions and get immediate replies within a few minutes of what's bothering them. They can check their blood pressure, their cholesterol, all at home, and it can be monitored back and forth. And, and, and studies can go on because of the data systems about what works for people under 45, over 45, with different prescriptions, and how do generics match up, and all of that is taking place. And there are employers in our state that say if Kaiser wasn't available, they could not provide health insurance because of the dramatic difference in those premiums. That's what you're trying to inherit on behalf of businesses, on behalf of families, and on behalf of, uh, uh, of our economy. Are those changes in this system? Because whether it's the business roundtable, the chamber of commerce, the small business groups, family groups, all of the rest of this, all of the indicators are getting worse with the status quo and with the constant incremental fooling around with the system. And that's where we are today. You don't get to do this without being comprehensive if you want the, 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 the savings and, 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 and the efficiencies and the expansion of service to people of quality care. Thank you. 30 seconds, sure. Um, and as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I, I think what's being left unsaid is that the, the health care systems that we operate right now, Medicaid pays 60 cents on a dollar, Medicare pays 70 cents on a dollar. You're discounting the impact of this cost escalation, and we're developing a new government system that's going to underpay, and that's our concern about it and, instead of a private market solution. Well, we... But we actually increase uh, for primary care the reimbursement for Medicaid up to Medicare levels. So, if anything, we're doing the. Opposite. I'm just saying a centralized system. Well, I think what there's well, what, ration care. Yeah. It, it, it we cuts. We my time. Off. I think what we're saying here is that, in order to have this kind of reform, to better care, lowering the cost, covering more people, making it more affordable, is that you have to have a comprehensive system because it's all in balance. So, with that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Well, that's okay. Well, we have a few. How much time we have? Yeah, why don't you get? Start in. Start in. Buckle your seatbelts, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Bumpy ride. How many people are out on the boat? Dr. Fox, your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I, I liked what Mr. Sessions said earlier in his characterization of what we're dealing with here. Um, you, we're dealing with a bill that you all say is very bad. That's the Senate bill. But you like the reconciliation bill. I think it's important to say and clarify this again for the American people. Once the Senate bill passes, 
and it goes to the president to be signed, it becomes law. So you're passing a bad bill, a bill most of you say you don't like, a bill that this, the um, chairman of this committee said she didn't like. So you're going to vote on that and pass that bill in the hope that you will be able to pass what is in the reconciliation bill to fix the bad things. And I think it's real important that we go over that occasionally in this debate or in this discussion to clarify that. The other thing that I'm... Well, would the gentleman yield on that? that? No. Okay. But at some point, well, I'd, I'd like, like to respond. I need to set the stage here. <laughs> the other thing is that we've been told over and over and over again that everything's going to be out there for 72 hours and that we'd have time to consider it. And we know that some of you have seen the manager's amendment, but we have not. We and manager. so it just came. But we're not going to have 72 hours have to be able to consider the manager's amendment before we vote on the rule and on this. So I just want to point out that the things that have been told to us are, are not accurate in terms of what the rules were going to be. Um, my, and the, I, I want to say that to put it in plain terms, the things that Mr. Ryan was saying a little earlier about spending money two times or saving it and spending it, you know, the folks in my district would say you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. And I think most people in this country understand that kind of language. I have several questions I want to ask. I'm going to start, um, if I can, uh, with Mr. Camp and say, uh, again, would you talk a little bit about the expanded role of the IRS in this legislation? Well, in the Senate bill, there is an unprecedented expansion of the IRS's authority. Um, and I would, I would say to my friends uh, on the other side, they have given a very articulate uh, description of central planning in health care. And this central planning will be enforced by the IRS. The IRS, under the bill, and I'm quoting, will regulate the economic and financial decisions about how and when health care is paid for and when health insurance is purchased. There will be an individual mandate, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> an individual mandate tax, which will be phased in over a period of years, which will go into effect fully into effect in 2016, which will be the greater of $750 per person up to $2,250 per household or 2% of household income, whichever is greater. And again, Can you go back and read that definition again of the role of the IRS. I just want everybody to hear that. That the IRS will regulate the economic and financial decisions about how and when health care is paid for and when health insurance is purchased. The IRS would be responsible for enforcing this individual mandate tax. That means the IRS would audit and assess interest and penalties on taxpayers who the IRS, the IRS determines did not purchase government-approved health care insurance or pay the individual mandate tax. And according to the Congressional Budget Office and November 20th analysis and the Joint Committee on Taxation, nearly half, 46 percent of the individual mandate tax collected by the IRS would be paid by households earning less than 300 percent of the federal poverty line. That's $66,150 for a family of four. And, and again, what was the president's promise about people not paying extra taxes? Well, the president's pledge was not to raise taxes on families earning less than $250,000 per year. Now, to, to assist the IRS in enforcing the individual mandate tax, the bill would require that everyone provide, that everyone who, who has health insurance uh, would send an informational return uh, like a 1099 uh, to the IRS, and also then, uh, if it's an employer, they would send it to the individual and the IRS as well. So the IRS will be charged with tracking the monthly health insurance status of roughly 300 million Americans, because even if you're out of compliance for one month, if you don't have health insurance for one month, under the legislation, you would pay one-twelfth of the annual penalties I, I went through earlier. Now. 
the Congressional Budget Office has assumed in their analysis that the IRS budget would have to grow by $10 billion. This is not my number. This is CBO's number. And that's not included in the cost of this bill. And that's not included in the analysis. And so while we had a big discussion on the CBO um, analysis, I agree with the analysis as far as it goes. Um, and the analysis does not include the $10 billion that CBO says in order to fulfill all these new duties and obligations in the legislation that they would need. And if you look at um, an estimate, uh, well, let me just say we did have testimony before the Ways and Means Committee just last this week uh, from the National Taxpayer Advocate. And the National Taxpayer Advocate is very concerned that the IRS will be able to offset people's refunds. So here you've been struggling to make ends meet. You finally get to April 15. You think you're going to be receiving a cash refund to help you and your family. And the IRS can offset that if you have, in any period of that year, gone without health insurance for any portion of any time. And has there been any analysis of how much this is going to cost employers in this country to send these statements out to the employees? No, I've not seen an analysis of uh, what the private sector obligations will be. The Congressional Budget Office only tracks what the government expense or the impact on the federal government will be. There's no comparative analysis on, on, on the private sector or on jobs. Uh, the legislation, though, would exempt two groups of people from the individual mandate tax. And the uh, two people, one is incarcerated individuals, because obviously they get health care by the fact that they're in prison. And secondly, illegal aliens. Those two groups of people are exempt. And uh, if you, um, I guess I would just conclude that. Can I follow up on that a minute? If illegal aliens are exempted from this, then that assumes something different from what I believe Mr. Andrews said earlier, was that illegal aliens would not be allowed to be covered under this bill. In, in answering Mr. Sessions' comments. Well, I will say this. They don't allow them into the exchange. So they can't, you know, there's an issue there of whether they do or don't. But, uh, but the, the, the concern is if, if an average American doesn't have health insurance and uh, the reason that they have to pay this individual mandate tax is the cost of them going to the emergency room without health insurance then why does that not apply to illegal aliens who will also be availing themselves of emergency room services when they need help? So I guess I would say that, you know, to summarize, illegal aliens will be able to, to continue to go to the emergency room, not have to be responsible for this individual mandate tax, while the uninsured American must pay that tax. And I would just close by saying there's an unprecedented level of uh, involvement by the IRS, a tr dramatic increase in their role and function uh, under this legislation that will add tens of billions of dollars to the cost of implementing this that's not included Let in the CBO report. Let me see if I can summarize what you just said about illegal aliens, because I want to get this clear. Illegal aliens will not have to pay a tax for not having insurance. They can continue to go to the uh, emergency room or get their care in free clinics or wherever. They don't have to pay a tax, right? Right. That's correct. But we will still be paying for their Do health Dr. care. Do, yeah. Do, yeah. Illegal, Do illegal aliens pay taxes? Are they, I mean, I, I don't, is that something we're collecting right now? Well, some do. Some do, obviously they do. Oh. They're working and they're They'd paying like, taxes. Well, the, we I, do that all the time. Could, could I respond? To, they're obligated to pay taxes whether they do and file is another issue, but they're certainly obligated so to. Some do and some don't. So they are paying tax. Some are paying taxes, some are not paying tax. Okay. Will the gentlelady yield for another question? Uh, if there is a... What I think what you were what we're saying here is they are they are not allowed to buy insurance through the exchange. So I don't see how you could penalize them for not buying it through the marketplace. So are you suggesting that we should allow our undocumented population to purchase insurance through the marketplace? Uh, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just trying to clarify 
what you all are allowing and not allowing. Well, under, uh, if I can just answer that real briefly, under the House bill, uh, we did allow our undocumented population to buy insurance uh, through, we call it the exchanges or the marketplace mechanism. Uh, there were several amendments that were offered uh, by members of, of your party, I recall at the time before this committee, uh, that would have ended the ability of our undocumented population to buy insurance through the exchange. Uh, I asked one of them, I recall, uh, how he intended to, to pay for that, because if we don't allow them to buy insurance, the subset that would buy it with their own money, uh, we are then forcing others to pay for their uncompensated care. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate bill does not have this provision. So <laughs> the gentlelady is correct that by not allowing undocumented immigrants to buy insurance through a marketplace, we are forcing taxpayers to cover the subset of them that would otherwise have insurance. Yield back. Dr. Fox, if, if you would yield for one quick observation. Is that oh, okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we also want to remember that because the undocumented were left out of the exchange and therefore cannot participate in the health program, their only access would be through the emergency room. They can't use the emergency room the way you use your doctor visit or regular hospital visit. When you go to an emergency room, you get care based on the, emer the urgency of your condition. And so for folks who are coming to the emergency room, it's because they have an emergency condition. If they don't, they go to the very back of the line and may or may not get treatment. It's the emergency room is left for those who have an emergent condition. So for example, a contagious disease. I don't believe that we would want to say that we would want to exclude anyone who happens to be in this country. If they have a contagious disease, the uh, bird uh, uh, flu or swine flu or whatever that was called, you would not want to exclude people if they truly have an emergency condition. So Thank you, Mr. at this Mr. stage, Mayor. that's what we leave the undocumented population with. Thank you. Ms. Fox, we have to go vote. Uh, we have three votes. Please come up at the end of as soon as possible. Well, House Rules Committee going into a short recess to attend votes in the House. Also meeting with President Obama coming to talk to members of Democratic Caucus. House.